I'd like to thank our top sponsor, Dean Anthony, for making this show possible. And welcome to the Cave of Apelles. Tonight I sit down with an insane Viking. That at least is what he is known for as an actor. He visits the cave to talk about subjects such as Stanislavski, how to act with credibility, and modern versus traditional Shakespeare performances. Rune Temte, welcome to the Cave of Apollos. Thank you, and thank you for having me. Are you ready to deliver? Hoo-hoo, always nervous, but you know, just get the camera rolling and then we're ready to go. Start talking. Um, well, that's one thing you know, with you as an actor. You basically decided to start acting when you were how old? It was a slow start, um, 25, 24. So, and you had not thought about that before at all? Or? Uh, I remember when I was uh, 12 or 13, there was a teacher at school, she said, yes, you should, you should get into acting. Maybe because I was uh, trying to be funny in the classroom. <laughs> Maybe it was a joke from her side, I don't know, but uh, after that... Uh, it had consequences. <laughs> of course, you know. You leave this room now. Mm. No, it uh, took a few years to get into the, what can I say, the, um, the training of it all, sort of getting into the serious business. Mm. Um, so yeah, you can say it took a few years. So it's a late bloomer, you could say. Mm. Mm. And then you went to, um, to uh, the drama school of London, right? Drama Studio London, yes, Thomas. yes, oh, yeah. DSL, yeah. yes, in uh, in London. I was going to say LSD, but it was yeah, yeah, so, yeah. And, uh, there was a lot of LSD in these, in these <laughs> okay, days. Okay, we, we don't need to talk about that. <laughs> but I, I was the Norwegian crazy Viking, and I wasn't. I didn't take any drugs. I didn't take any alcohol. So for for you didn't them, need to, it. yeah, exactly. <laughs> I was on the DNA from the Vikings, you know. Uh, I was used to the mushrooms, no, but um, it was quite. Uh, <laughs> In, in a way, when you say no, less DSL, <laughs> uh, let's not talk about the LSD. It's quite funny you say that because you know I felt like uh, I felt like uh, someone. Uh, it was so much drugs, you know, and uh, maybe that was uh, uh, people's idea that to be creative that they had to have some substances, uh, you know, to get into the mood. I mean, there's many theories of this, but. In a way, it was so strange because I was so straight, you know. And also because it was because I started late. I had a career as a sportsman before that. I studied business, <laughs> yes. Yeah. And uh, so it was like, oh, I get this chance to to enjoy, uh, to do, to fulfill my dream, to go into a drama school. So I was like, oh, I was all in as as uh, <laughs> as uh, with everything. So it was very strange. But of course, in the last week, it all changed, and then they saw the real. Viking coming out. And, <laughs> yeah, oh, that's good. He didn't come out the first week, but the last one. <laughs> okay, uh, but but uh, is that um, where you you uh, learned uh, uh, from basically from the principles, I guess, of uh, Stanislavski, or is that a separate thing? Yeah, no. Uh, Drama Studio London is uh, was for me a, a one one year postgraduate year. So it was, uh, what can I say, if you say uh, acting technique, there was mm. a lot of stuff within that frame that you will learn different techniques. Mm. And the whole aim with that school is uh, how to go into the business and survive and actually to get work. Uh, so uh, not just the acting principles? Everything. Yeah. We mm. actually, uh, yeah, we, uh, they had, uh, and this was back in 94, and they were doing like, uh, you know, promotion classes, how to write a resume, how to get your headshot done, all this kind of stuff, you know. Mm. It's even more important now. I mean, if you don't have a show reel, if you don't have the uh, everything, the marketing stuff behind it, um, it's, um, yeah, it's, uh, you need that. Mm. So the school was very good in that sense. And I think it was good because they g gave you different tools. So it wasn't just in one direction. That's great. Yes, yeah. and because in the end of the day, you have to get some work. You have to be <laughs> become a working actor. Some of us, some people become movie stars, but most of us are working actors. Not not most of us actually. Most 
actors are unemployed i would say mm. they do other jobs like you know waitresses and waiters and doing other stuff mm. so to become a, a working actor to actually be able to do what you train for that's a big job and i think dsl uh, <laughs> they they did a great job so uh, but introduced to stanislavski um that was uh, actually in a private school in Norway and it was called uh, Theater Project 84. The, the school first appeared in 84. I was there in 89 and they basically blue copied the idea from a school in London called Drama Center London. Um, so they actually took the idea of how to create uh, good students, uh, actors, um, from that school in London. Mm -hmm, okay, but but uh, going back to DSL, uh, uh, what were the, the acting principles you learned there, and uh, were those different from Stanislavski? Because it would be interesting to sort of get the bullet points on ex like what specific techniques did yeah. you learn? They say that everything starts with Stanislavski. I mean, he was the first to put it down on paper. Mm -hmm. I mean, it doesn't start with him, of course, but he was when he founded the um, the uh, Moscow Art Theater, and uh, you know, in the eight, it was in eighteen ninety eight, I believe. So then he put into writing what was the principle of trying to become or become a good actor. So I wouldn't say that Drama Studio escaped any of those principles, but they would give you different tools. They would uh, have different approaches. Sometimes you can't wait for the inspiration. You can't wait for the motivation, how to move. That's a cliche with the method of Stanislavski actors that they have to feel, they have to know, have the motivation to move. Mm. But maybe sometimes uh, at the school they said, why don't you just start to move? See what happens. <laughs> you know, we have to get on with it. Mm. So it's they we were we were taught how to movement. You know, how to approach um, a character in a different way. So yeah. I, I, to yes, I presume. I, I mean, I don't act, but I presume that one problem could be sort of you know that you're really aware of yourself. And I mean, that the contrast between that and what appears from for the audience as something that is realistic. Yeah, you know, the kind of the preparation to be able to present something <clears throat> that uh, the, the, the audience might consider as art. There's many hours mm. to prepare to be an actor, how we will have to, we have to be all the things we have to go through. Mm before we're there in front of the camera or in front of the, uh, uh, or on the stage, it's, it's so many hours and it can, so, it can be so many different things. Um, roll around on the floor in movement class, pretending you're a, you know, a, a shrimp or something. I mean, <laughs> at the time, you don't know what, if you're gonna use it for, for anything. Mm -hmm. But as you say, it's all about preparing yourself. It's about opening your body, it's getting the breathing right, because this is what we have, right? Mm. This is the instrument, our body, our mind, our soul. Mm. So um, DSL, Drama Studio London, I think they had a, they had different approaches to how to prepare an actor mm. to become a working actor. Right. So um, and the most important lessons you got from there were, were what? Like what do you use when you're actually acting now? You didn't believe it at the time when they said uh, how to go in with the same motivation and the same eager to get the job after you had 99 rejections. Mm -hmm. When you go in for the hundredth time, how to be just as much prepared, just as motivated. So, and having said that, there's so many ways to get there, of course, but mm. uh, that's one of the things that, of, of course, it was also, um, being in Britain, being in London, with their history, uh, I was uh, thrilled to be introduced to Shakespeare. Mm. 
from from a ex footballer's point of view coming from uh, um because we did stage some some Shakespeare plays at school. Or yes, yes, yes. And we were working with a great uh, teacher called Patrick Tucker. And he went back to the first portfolio. So he was actually teaching around the world from the portfolio, what was the supposedly the original uh, plays uh, from Shakespeare's hand. Uh -huh. uh, Mm. Meaning, meaning what that they were changed and or amended later or what? Yeah, I mean this is this is uh, with uh, many great writers like that. There are different versions. There's rewrites. Mm -hmm. There are adjustments. And uh, Shakespeare, uh, he adjusted as he was acting. He was an acting himself. The audience changed. They didn't like King Lear. Da 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 da. So so they say that. Uh, the first portfolio. This is where you can find. You know, this was it. Mm -hmm. Believe it or not, I don't know. But our teacher, he said that, and he would he would go into that, and it was very exciting for me to be introduced uh, to Shakespeare in that way. And obviously, we had the thing with this school that you would get up on stage and perform every two weeks, three weeks, in front of the other students, or they invited people in. So I think this is this is something that that. I learned from this. You have to, you have to go up there to do your stuff. You have to. This is because it's all about practice. Mm -hmm. I mean, I I, <clears throat> I uh, listened to you in a Norwegian podcast, and you were t were talking about how an important thing is to not be afraid of making a fool out of yourself. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's. Um... It's we're in a risk-taking business. Mm. It's like jumping off the uh, cliff every time, mm. and you have to get to that stage that it doesn't matter. Mm. And uh, making a fool out of yourself it's a, it's a way of saying you have to take a risk. Mm. You have to try something that you 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 don't know where it's going to end. And this is and this can some people have it like from their born and maybe generations today people young people growing up today maybe they have it more than we had I don't know but uh, um, maybe it's more accepted but uh, it's different in life uh, and the art even though they are very closely uh, <clears throat> they live very close together obviously mm. but uh, to get to that stage it has something to do with um, age. Because uh, it, it's also about confidence. So um, was that, that an advantage for you then, sort of starting a bit later than I guess your? No, I, I was very insecure. Uh -huh. uh, I was um, for me coming from <laughs> something that is not art at all. You know. Athletics. You were you were uh, on a uh, national team, I guess. In yeah, Norway I was uh, for the uh, for our uh, English speaking uh, listeners and viewers here. We have a game in Norway called Bandy, and it's very famous. Only six six nations plays it, and uh, I'm obviously <laughs> I was in the national team. But uh, this was like uh, this was what I was doing, and I played football in the in the on, on the top level in Norway. Uh, also did one year in London in a club there, but this is where I came from. And to to say you suddenly you're going into the arts, it's it's a big jump. And in, in America they love it. Oh, you've been an athlete. Oh, that's fantastic. You know, this is different. You've seen so many. You've seen people today in front of the camera. They 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 went from being great athletes and athletes, and now they are in front of the camera. So this is different. But in Norway it's like. An artist and uh, doing arts, you can't come from that background. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was really hard in the beginning of all your struggle. And uh, the school in Norway, this uh, method acting school, it didn't do me any favors either, because they were <clears throat> they basically were they were tearing you apart and but how so, breaking. How so? Sorry, how so? Uh, breaking you down, taking away everything. They were. Trying to rebuild you as a as an artist and taking away everything that you learned from you were young with your habits and bad and good habits, so it was quite destructing, uh, destructive in 
Mm-hmm. You know, you have to, you have to suffer for your art. You have to oh clean God. the floor. Yeah. You know, you have to go all through this. Excuse my language. Bullshit. Because in the end of the day, you have to be given the opportunity, the confidence to do something you never imagined you would do. Mm-hmm. And this comes from, of course, there's a little bit of, a little bit of this, but it's, it's, because it, there's so much nerves, there's so much uncertainty, there's so much struggling with yourself, struggling with the environment, expectations, it's so much of this already. So you don't need more, you aren't good enough. Hmm. Uh, you don't need the American severe way of saying uh, everything is good, I'm not going to tell you you're bad. You know, you don't need that either. But it's, for me, it's better to hear this is okay, you're good, you're doing well. Because you also navigate, you know it's not okay, I can do better than, you know. Mm-hmm. So the school wasn't very good for me in that way because I was struggling with coming <laughs> coming out <laughs> as, a, as, a, as an artist. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then I, um, I don't know if these kind of jokes are allowed anymore. Uh, in, the, in the cave they are. Because <laughs> it's like, I'm not saying anything bad about anyone. I'm just, it's just my kind of sense of humor, you know. So, uh, yeah, but anyway. No, but, but in, the, in that school in Norway, yeah. pre-London, pre-LSD, yeah. DSL, sorry. Yeah, yeah, slip of the tongue. Um, yeah, because I'm so concerned with, with understanding what... I mean, what were they trying to do? They were trying to do. Yeah, like, like the principles of that Stanislavski we're talking about, because you know, everybody talks about Stanislavski. Yeah. So specifically, what like wh- why is he like the grand the master? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you you mentioned one thing that he had said. What was it? Uh, don't act, do. Yeah. <clears throat> don't act, do. I mean, he was after the truth. He wanted people to be um, um, living, breathing human beings on stage. Mm-hmm. So that's that's the sort of the the base of it all. Um, it, I, he called it he called it spiritual naturalism hmm. because he wanted to breathe spiritual life into every character that was created on stage. Mm. Right. Mm. I remember reading that he had, I guess, yeah, in his younger years or youth or whatever, I'm not quite sure about the dates, he was in contact with some, um, uh, the Duke of Meiningen. I read about it in a biography on, on Ibsen. And this duke was very concerned with theater. Mm. And speaking of what you just said there, that, that you know, all the, the minor roles, just someone in the background, had to be a realistic character. Mm. And you could be the star, but the next time you would, have to, you would be someone mm. in the background and you should play that role as well as if you were, mm. you, you were doing yeah, as, yeah. A, as a main character. No, but this is the principle, I think. And there's been misunderstandings and afterwards what was really Stanislavski and then of course if we move into the movie business as they um, his company toured to America and then later we got the um, the, um, the actor studio in in, in uh, New York with uh, more moving into what we know as the method method uh, acting yes. method but acting. are those the same or is a slight um, originally, Stanislavski was touring with one of Chekhov's productions to America in mid-30s, and then he met um, Elia Kazan with oh. others, yes, and they were, had then the, the theater, the studio group, so it was a theater group in New York. So they were so, I mean, they'd never seen anything like this. They saw, you know, it was in Russian, but they, they were totally, um, you know, mind blown by this work. Mm-hmm. So they started to, uh, to work together. Um, 
some um, Yogin Valgarov um, was also the lead, he was the lead, <clears throat> was the lead uh, actor with, uh, with Stanislavski. So they were together. So today it says that Stanislavski, uh, the, the, the studio, um, actor studio in New York, is based on Stanislavski, his student, and the American uh, interpretation of this work. That's mm -hmm. what it says today. Mm -hmm. So they started to work together, they were so excited with this, and then one of the Kazan invited his former student, uh, Lee Strasberg, so to come, and that was in 47, I mean, uh, uh, as far as I remember. And then, so it was uh, then the, what we know today, uh, the actor studio was founded. So the basis there, obviously, <clears throat> um, the, the base is there and the base is you want them to tell the truth, you know, mm -hmm. the characters should speak the truth. So yes, you can say, but they also made their own. <clears throat> they worked with it themselves to, to fit what they needed. And then of course we know uh, from there on so many great movie actors has been in that studio, right? So some, is it a Lee Strasberg system or is it a Stanislavski system? But I think uh, every, it seems like they base everything on, on Stanislavski, yes. Mm. So then you got Stella Adler, you got Meissner, all these great names in the world of acting that people lean towards when they are trying to become working actors. <laughs> um, but then again, when Stanislavski was asked, so do we put like, is it ordinary life? Like you want them to speak the truth. We want to see real people on stage. Is it like ordinary life? No, it's not. Uh, <clears throat> it's the essence of a person. Right. Like um, in your world, it would be, is it a, pho uh, is it a photography yeah. or is it a painting? Exactly. It's two different things. So the essence is there in the, in the painting. Yeah. It's the essence, something that will bring us further, that will uh, a further understanding of it. Is it the same thing as, because I'm so into Robert McKee's book, uh, Story Now. Um, you know, you, of course, this goes all back to, to the Poetics by Aristotle also, you know, that pops up whenever you start you know, reading something about storytelling, <coughs> whether it's acting or well, and screenwriting uh, in, in McKee's case. And he, he's talking about how you had that discussion between, you know, if, is it a plot or character? Mm. And he says, well, those two things are the same because the character shows the plot through his actions. The problem is when you have characterization instead of character. And I mm. think that's what you, what you just touched upon. That's sort of the, you know, getting every, all the information in there and you sort of break up the story because there's so much uh, information, photographic information, so to speak, journalistic information that is given that you, you don't get the essence of that character. Mm -hmm. When you say character and characterization, uh, in Robert McKee's world, character is made when uh, the main character of, of your story, he has to come to, uh, he, uh, he's met with obstacles and he has to make choices yes. under pressure. Yes. But a characterization, that can be, that's something else. And that's why coming back to your point with don't act, do. Yeah. So you don't act, you do things. Mm -hmm. And this also brings me back to what I think is the essence of, of Stanislavski, of any great work, and also with Robert McKee, is that they are going for the action. They're yeah. going for the action. And I'm not talking about, I'm, I'm talking about the actions in decisions. It's not yeah. about blowing up. Yeah, or houses. a lot of gesticulation. No, no, no. That's one thing I, I, 
uh, wanted to do in our, our conversation to, to sort of transfer what you say about acting to painting because it, there's so much, I mean, the similarity is if you're trying to tell a story, what helps the story and what hinders the story. And what I'm concerned with is when you have someone who, who wants to create a story and they think the more the figures gesticulate, the more wild expressions they have, the more content there is in it. Mm -hmm. But of course, that just becomes... Um, uh, th there's no direction on it then. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of... I mean, I think there's another book by, um, by Blake Snyder, Save the Cat, where he says th there's a lot of... of uh, there's a lot of action, but no story or something like that, mm -hmm. you know. If it's just for effect, you know. Yeah. I've been going over this so many times that what do you need for the movie? You need a script, 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 and the story. You need the plot. It, it has to be there. Mm. You can throw in how many, you know, killings or <laughs> rapes or people getting their shirts off. I mean, you can do that as much as you want, but if it's not a story there, and what is the story? Is it or a great character? I mean, you need, you need a great character, obviously, that uh, people will follow. There can be two or three characters that you follow, but um, yes, I believe you need you need that story that people will get engaged in, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> And they can, of course, work on different levels, uh, depending of the style, depending on, on your audience, where you want with it, what you want to tell. Obviously, it can be surrealistic, it can be a, what we will say, a more European style, maybe more concerned with the inner conflicts than maybe what we would say as a cliche. Um, a Hollywood movie, maybe sometimes they're more concerned with the other, com uh, the other conflicts of where the uh, characters meet their obstacles. I don't know, mm. but you need a good story. Um, so what, what intrigued you with, uh, because um, we should mention also that this is you as the insane Viking. Insane? <laughs> Explain, please. <laughs> no, I didn't, mean me to, I didn't mean to insult you. <laughs> <laughs> No, 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 but explain, what, what, what did you find insane with its character? This is interesting. <laughs> this is Abba from uh, The Lost Kingdom. I, uh, uh, you know, there, there's something about, it, that also has to do with how you think as an actor. Because I, you know, you have this guy who has no problem using violence and who listens to this, um, uh, his... Story. Uh, his magician. Uh, yeah, or, or, with uh, the runes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And you get a sense of how the figures around him know that if he's not happy somehow, then you just better hide, you know? <laughs> I'm happy now. <laughs> I'm not the character, so I'm very happy. <laughs> no, but I mean, it's... it's um, uh, well, I thought about it. When you're talking about what, what is the story, what, yeah. what's the appeal of the story? Yeah. And I thought about... Uh, so, so you're... you're um, a, a main antagonist, I guess you could say, to the the, the sort of the, the hero of the yes, the series yes, yes. Uh, Uthred, yeah. the, that character, um, and uh, who fights to get back what he sees mm. as you know belonging to him, and mm. you are then one of those who are sort of in his way, right? Mm. And he ends up killing you, and you know it's good that you. Oh, no, no, spoiler! Oh, spoiler oh. alert! Oh no, no! <laughs> oh my God! Cut the out. sequel! The cut sequel! Out, cut out! Cut out! <laughs> no, no. Um, right. uh, so, but that touches on on a basic idea of what a story is, and that is the uh, the word primal. Mm -hmm. That I mean, it, yeah. And I thought about that. Why is it appealing? Because I was I was sitting and looking at the story uh, that the those uh, um, I've, yeah I've seen five five episodes so far and I noticed I was sitting a little bit like you know sort of a, ten, a bit tense mm. you know not seriously like this mm. but I was like oh god what's, what's going on here and you think when you are up against a sky like this and you need to go there you need to pass him and how the hell do you do that what would I do in that situation yeah and I think that that at least is I think this is one part what would I do if I was this guy or yeah. that, that guy or, or because then it's like who am I I'm speaking of yeah. showing your character through yeah. that obstacle 
I mean, this is you. This is you're telling this from the audience point of view, yeah, right? Yeah. Mm. But it's also interesting what you say now, because we're coming back to Stanislavski. He had one magic word, and that was what? What if? The oh. what if? And that opens a whole specter of possibilities. Okay. So in your acting, what if this guy was a serial killer? And I'm going to pass him. Yeah. So as an actor, what if uh, when I pass him, I'll fall off a cliff? Mm. And this is very much used in, uh, with Stanislavski and he repeats this over and over again. Of course, it opens for your imagination and your imagination is maybe the biggest and the most important tool any actor has. But, but sort of technically then, just to try to understand what you're saying, uh, so when you're going into a role, you, I mean, you know the script, what the script says, but then the what if makes it not just sort of repeating the words that you've read, but you have to act as if there's not the, the, the continuation of the scene is not certain. Well, no, it's a what if to open your uh, imagination and, uh, and uh, Stanislavski is not so interested in the word he would uh, different, differentiate uh, imagination and fantasy. Okay. Even though, because fantasy was not something that could never happen, but mm. in my world, oh, yeah. they're all together. Mm. So opening the what if is is a, a fantastic tool you can have. So mm. in a text, it's uh, a what if this character will kill someone? It will bring life. He used that to put you in a situation. What if you are about to die? Well, you know, the big questions mm -hmm. is like, what, what if you have cancer? Will this change the scene? Mm -hmm. That opens for so many. Um, it basically opens for, as I said, the tool number one, our imagination. Mm -hmm. So then we can go back to saying, yes, but you have to learn all all the uh, specifics from all the masters before, all the techniques, yeah. everything. So maybe in the end of the day, you can say, okay, what do, what, but all of this is there to feed the opening of your imagination. Yeah. But then on a pure technical level, then I can imagine, um, or maybe I should ask the question negatively, what are the biggest faults you can make as a character? If you, I mean, like, you, you, okay, um, so, so that's one, one question to ask, but another one is when you got that role, you got the manuscript, you're working with the manuscript, and you sort of know that mm -hmm. what you're going to say, when you're going to the actual filming, like, what is in your mind now? Are you conscious that now I'm, I'm acting, Abba, or is it you have to really be in that person's head? Mm -hmm. I mean, this is the this is the thing that uh, method actors or Stanislavski method actors all often hear that you 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 know, come on, it's just a job. You have to finish at one time. You know, mm. you can't live the character twenty four seven, right? No, no. So this is what we hear uh, uh, all the time. It's like in uh, Marathon Man from seventy six when two classical train two actors meet with two different. Um, specific trainings was Dustin Hoffman and Sir Lawrence Olivier. So you know the story, right? Mm. Yeah, exactly. So he says, uh, Dustin Hoffman's been up all night running around, da 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 da. He comes in and then Sir Lawrence Olivier says, you know, why don't you just try acting there, boy? You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so this is the thing, maybe, do I have to live as a insane? Um, Viking 24-7. No, no, but I mean, like in that, when you're doing the actual recording. And this is, this is also a thing that we can prepare. We can read again Stanislavski. Mm. Very, very useful. As when we spoke earlier, I said this, there's uh, some things that always come back to me. And it comes from this work with Stanislavski. And it's the questions I will ask myself. Some details has to be there. But everything we do, all the preparation we spoke about earlier, what DSL taught me, a movement, voice work, everything. In the moment of the action, boom, then it's all gone. 
Okay. It's only you and yeah. the fellow actor. I call him the fellow actor. Mm. There, you're in it together. You're in mm. the situation. The camera is there. Uh, you're on stage. The audience is there. Then that's the moment. Mm. You can't think that I'm going to be sad. The moment is lost. That's fascinating. Yes. Because with the audience, oh, I have to think now that to be sad, I have to think about when my dog died in 1976. No, you don't have time for that. Mm. That's in the, pre uh, the preparation room. How to get into that emotion. So you have to open up your body. If you need to think about your dead dog to be sad, oh, please do. But, you know, <laughs> but it's very sad. All means do. You know, but this is, this is the preparation. Mm. This is the preparation. Yeah. And, and when you're younger, when you, I mean, as you get older, you've been in this, you open your body more. You're open to, to connecting with the different feelings to, easier. Yes. Mm. So then you do all that preparation uh, before. But in the moment, it's all about being here and now in front of the camera yeah. or in front of the audience. And um, that, that, yes, I think that's, that's what we aim for. And how we get there? different techniques, di different methods. But I think that's to be with Uber in front of the camera as this character. Yes, there are there's choices to be made. You have to make choices. And the magic what if, the, the, the what if is also in the, in the preparation room. Do I say what if I was a Viking in uh, 624? No. I don't do that. For me, it's, it's more, what if I had to save my family from drowning? Mm. To what extent will I, Runa, go to protect them? Mm. And this is prepared before I go in front of the camera. But that will open up. That sensation, that willpower, that, that desire to act that maybe Uber will have when he protects his farm or his, his boat, yeah. essential, his boat. But then you have to also have to... Uh, uh, that's is, sorry? No, is this something that... You take this for granted, what I say, or...? No, I think I understand. Well, I can explain it like this. Um, I always come back to that, that um, uh, something I learned from uh, preparing for a previous conversation on, on Taoism, mm -hmm. Chinese philosophy. And there was one professor who talked about this. There's a, they have a concept of um, uh, Wu Wei, which means effortless action. Mm -hmm. You're not, so you, of course, you're conscious, but but it's not like oh, I have to say yeah. this and this and do that and that. Uh, you sort of just do it, but because you are prepared beforehand, right? Yeah. <clears throat> and there's this professor who then says that he played a game called mind ball. Okay. We had these electrodes, or like not on your brain, but <laughs> on the outside of your head, <clears throat> and it measures how calm you are. Mm. And so does the other one on the other side, and there's a ball that is sort of being being pushed mm. on according to how calm you are. Mm. And if you are calm, the ball is pushed against the other towards the other person, right? And he was very calm, and, he, and listened to that ball move, and he had his mm. eyes closed. But then he was so curious that he opened his eyes, and the ball was almost at the, the opponent's uh, goal. And then he was like, "Oh yes, almost." And then it came straight back to him because then he started. To, <laughs> <laughs> try to, to win, right? Yeah. And it, it sounds a bit similar to uh, what you're saying then. It's not that you have to forget what you know or whatever, but, no. but not be... Uh, I don't know how to formulate it. It's, uh, it's something about, well, effortless action, I guess. <laughs> it's about relaxation. Mm. You have to let go. And um, you should not decide too much in, before you go in. Um, Dennis Hopper, uh, we all met him in blue velvet, of course. He says that you should not decide before you go in. Mm. Obviously, the director, you will have some choices to be made, but it's about being open. What will happen in this situation? Mm. Yeah. 
uh, and it's so much about and, and you know going back to the days coming from my career as a, as a football player as, a, as an athlete it was all about energy it was all oh, yeah, oh. and you know come on boys <laughs> yeah and of course we knew that Uber has a lot of energy but it, yeah. he's relaxed yeah because the camera picks up everything and we yeah. don't want to see that that because in tensing up, you close, you close yourself. Right. You close yourself and what you should be doing, this is very specific, so I don't know how interesting it is. No, please. But this is, uh, it's not often you can go into these details about your work, so I'm very thankful for that. So this is about opening your chakras. It's opening your bodies on all the levels, opening for your imagination mm. to connect with something greater, something bigger, that will boom, I'm here now with everything I've been working on. Mm -hmm. So, and the tensing up, it doesn't help us. It doesn't help us at all. No. And especially in front of the camera. You see the best movie actors in the world are totally relaxed. Okay, they will go in with full force, they will shout, they will scream, they will beat. But there's a re relaxation. Mm -hmm. If you force everything, on the camera. If you force it, you will not be able to open up for all the nuances we have within our spectre as a, as a human being. Mm. Um, and there's so many layers you can say, okay, we can always communicate on two levels. We are two-dimensional, three-dimensional. If you work martial art for many years, maybe you can go to, uh, to three-dimensional conversation, you know, to, uh, to be able to communicate, but still, there's so many nuances, right? And but I believe that... you have to open up. And it sounds maybe strange when you're playing a character like this. It's not about go going in with full force, it's actually being relaxed. Because I can imagine that, <clears throat> um, I think you'll remember for a few years that I called you insane in that role. Um, <laughs> but but <laughs> I can imagine if you, uh, if you're if you're playing of a, a fault for an actor could be to to overdo it. I'm supposed to be uh, crazy somehow, and 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 uh, it just becomes unrealistic because it's like that all the time. Or yeah, so this is what uh, Stanislavski also talks about. It's like the mechanical way of doing things. It's showing what the audience uh, are supposed to experience. Oh yes, I'm showing. I'm you know. We can do this, right. I, but th so this is something else. They don't taking want over that. the audience's role, so, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, and they don't want that. Mm. I mean, in, in talk, you know, tell the truth. Mm. Uh, <laughs> is it that difficult, Robert Mitchum? He said, "Hit your mark, look the guy in the eye, and tell the truth." I mean, how <laughs> difficult can it be? <laughs> Come on, guys. <laughs> Why? <laughs> what? Uh, we can discuss whether he was successful or not, but still, he was a great actor. He did, mm. I don't know, they, these guys do 150, 60, 170 movies. Mm. So, um, no, I think it's uh, to, for me to go in. Also, it's, it's a cliche to see that a, a, a Viking is very, of course, <laughs> <laughs> of course, he shouts. You know, <laughs> well, yeah, I was, I was thinking, <laughs> it's like in the, yeah, in the, uh, it's a spoiler alert. But uh, yeah, this character dies uh, unfortunately he, as he did uh, in real but life. But you look great, though. Oh, thank you. <laughs> but then, and of course, it was important to get the axe in my hand because if mm. you, the Viking don't get the axe in his hand, he will not go to Valhalla and as we know it's not over in Valhalla that you are with Odin and Freya and you drink and feast and you train for the biggest uh, uh, fights of uh, all time yeah. Ragnarok right? Right, right so you have to have the axe in your hand and I was going the director was there bam 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 I went uh, you know <laughs> a smile maybe let's try that or a scream and he said Runa uh <laughs> we had enough screams from you as over. Let's just do it quiet. <laughs> so I'm not saying that you should not go in this direction, like putting on voice or, or uh. you know, doing these things. But it's also an, an approach like a, an insane character like this, a, a villain. 
uh, and especially when we see, uh, think of uh, the archetypes of Vikings, they're big, the tall, beard, bomb, blah, 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 blah. But uh, in my choice here was to <coughs> maybe underplay it. Mm. Um, because then when you do scream, no. which you do at Maybe. times, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> then it has a really strong effect. And I think that's one thing that that, um, uh, it, that I noticed in that series that that um, or that I'm th thinking about in general um, when it comes to you know uh, novels or, or f movies or whatever. One thing is to 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 sort of imitate sort of outer action movement, mm -hmm. you know, actual physical movement. But then it's in the imitation of how that you know how he given his character would react. Mm -hmm. <laughs> For example, this, that funny scene which uh, starts that whole last fight, where uh, Uther says uh, first blood or to the end, mm -hmm. and you, your ass says ah, <laughs> you know, okay, I, it's probably to yeah. the end, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, so that, that's very credible yeah, yeah. that uh, that Uba would react like that. Yeah. You know, it's, so it's uh, doesn't have to be. Um, a specific thing to say or a specific, specific thing to act, but just one reaction that is much more realistic and, yeah. and says much more about his character, or, or the poignant. Uh, and of course, it's, it's, it's uh, when it's set up in the right way, which mm -hmm. I did in the Last Kingdom. Um, it's set up in the first scene. You see uh, Raven, um, beautifully played by legend Rutger Hauer. He says, "Do you see this guy?" Mm. Yeah, <laughs> never fight him. <laughs> you know, I noticed that because yeah. that's exactly what he does then at, at the end, and that's also yeah. there's all all this. Um, uh, I, and I think that's also perhaps a a challenge with it because it's a series mm. that you have to have something here that is picked up here. Yeah, yeah. So there is some kind of mirroring from you know each end or or across uh, some expanse of time mm. to connect the story. Yeah, it's a difference between, you know, movies, TV series, mm. different way of storytelling. Mm. And if we bring stage work in as well, yeah. it's, it's, it, that must it's, be a different... some, it's something else. Even though the training, as we come back to Mr. Stanislavski and his <laughs> method, so it comes back to a base there that is, 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 um, is the same. Mm. When, when you asked in LA by people so where do you come from ba, 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 ba. obviously they're not here that I come from Scandinavia but they see it by the looks and they <laughs> what have you done and I said yeah you know a couple of things um, theater come from the theater <gasps> you know are you doing the real work the real acting oh so this is how it's considered oh. also by a lot of people that actually coming British actors are very highly uh, valued, you know, because they've done all the, all the stuff you do on stage. So that's like yeah, uh, serious that, oh, yes. stuff. And you see some of the actors like Al Pacino, you see um, some of the great actors, uh, they, done, they also go, go into um, to stage work and they also done that, you mm. know. So it's a base there that I think can be used, obviously, in front of the camera. But it doesn't necessarily mean that a, a, an, a, an actor that all, all, uh, only did uh, theatre is good in front of the camera. And this we've seen um, so many examples of in a small communi community as the Norwegian. Because then you have all the actors, they do everything, you know. And you have maybe uh, in the old days 500 actors and they should be in front of the camera as well. And you can see that there's something there that it, it's, it's, it's a special skill. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's something that, yeah, sometimes you can see that people being too much on a stage and not in front of the camera. Mm. And it's, so is it, is everything bigger and on the stage, does it has to have to be bigger? Yes, in a way, because you have to reach 1000 people in back of, in back of the um, audience. You have to uh, explain your um, emotions in a different way. In front of the camera, the lens is there. 
So, you know, it's a difference. But saying that a thing that we hear a lot is less is more, mm. less is more in front of the camera. But I disagree because less than less, I mean, there's nothing. I mean, you know, you come in with something. <laughs> You come in with something, mm. as as our master said. You know, it's not real life; it's uh, it's an essence of life. Mm. So you bring something. That's my job to bring something. Uba, I need to bring something. So that's why I'm saying, I bring an energy. I bring the energy from all the work I've done, and uh, in the moment with the other people with the camera, boom, it's gone. But there's something there, right? Mm. And this is the energy that I bring, and that's not. That's not nothing. I was thinking about something that um, there's a famous uh, uh, jiu-jitsu uh, um, practitioner, uh, Hickson Gracie. He talks about, of course, it comes uh, initially from Japan. And then we're talking about also um, something at least close to Taoism. Uh, and he talked about the empty mind. Mm -hmm. That when he would go in, you didn't have an idea specifically that I should do this and then he does that and mm. I can do my thing there. Yeah. But it's like he goes in and is completely open to whatever happens. Mm. And if something suddenly comes from this direction, he's, he's from here. Mm. If you come from, from this direction, he's suddenly here. He doesn't have a specific idea of exactly what he's supposed to do. It's just, is that something you can recognize? Yes. And uh, um, I mean, for me, that's an ideal situation. Mm -hmm. But then again, to get to that point that you can be there in this, create that atmosphere for yourself, it also has to be created by, by the team around you. Because mm. there are very much specific yeah. things to do that you have to use. You, you can't have a blank mind. No, 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 it's not, you, it's no, not no, a no. literal term, you have, yeah. yeah, yeah, I know, but still, huh. you, have to, you have to create the blank mind mm. And also knowing where's you, where's your mark, mm. where where's the camera, <laughs> it's very where, where 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 where's the where's the <laughs> imaginary spaceship yeah. to your left? Yeah. I mean all this stuff you have to, but still. Yeah. And then suddenly you will actually have someone behind the camera, texting, or they will do something else. Oh, God, and still yeah. you have to have the space. You you have to have that. No, I don't see this. I'm mm. in the moment and i have a blank mind i think some of uh, yeah you can know you're doing a terrible job when you start to think about things mm -hmm. uh, i've as i said earlier i'm now gonna think that i'm going to be sad or i'm starting to think about what i'm going to do afterwards i'm going to oh, think God, that no. my <laughs> my fellow actor is there's something wrong with his you know yeah that's the worst thing because then you're out of that, that zone where anything can happen. Because mm. then it's controlled. But have you ever experienced then? <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> that's, that's interesting. Have you ever, ever experienced then not sort of being in zone or being nervous or for some <laughs> reason, and then being able to just play solely by the mechanics of your craft? Oh, I, I, uh, or, or do, is that no, but sometimes you have to. You have to yeah. deliver. Yeah. I mean, you have to deliver. The whole room is fall, falling down. Mm. It, it's another thing for us. <laughs> Rule number, I don't know, five, never stop acting mm. until you hear cut. Because, mm. you know, mm. there's $25,000 here in the room and they're not, it's not about you. It's not <laughs> just about you, buddy. <laughs> so, you know, the whole room is falling down. Don't stop acting. Oh, my shoe is itching. I, you know, there's a spider in my back. You know, I'm in the middle of the jungle. Don't stop acting, <laughs> you know. So it's, it's something about that. And sometimes you just mm. have to deliver. Mm. I, I did a, a TV series just uh, a couple of weeks ago in Rome and there was just a big, big conference room. Everything was like, and I was just losing the text. I was just so self-conscious, uh, you know, and I thought, okay, I just have to deliver. Mm. Deliver the lines. It's not about me. I'm not the main character. Just get it done. Yeah. But I didn't feel comfortable all, at all. Yeah. I was like, um, I started off saying that I was very nervous coming into this world of arts, trying to be an actor. And that was the feeling I had after 
everything I'd done. But of course, I was relying on everything I'd done also, so I knew I would deliver something, mm. you know. So that was, I know it's a terrible feeling when you're not there. And we all, actors, we, we all been there when, oh, you know, it, it wasn't there. But then again, in front of the camera, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, if it, you know, we will work around it. And now it's not, you know, you can take so many takes, you'll get something that works. But um, as an actor, we, um, most of us, we want it to be right. And it's a huge scene. We want it to be r right, you know. And it doesn't really matter because it's going to be edited anyway. Mm -hmm. You know, on stage, it's different. Hold on. I didn't get it right. <laughs> rewind. Just, <laughs> rewind. Can we do it again? You know, it, it, it's a different ball game. Mm -hmm. But then, speaking of uh, stage work, um, that, that's one thing I want to hear your thought of. Uh, also, this idea of... Uh, when it comes to Shakespeare, mm. um, or, or well, staging is in general, uh, so-called modern or so-called traditional staging, mm. what are your thoughts on that? Is it, do we need to sort of update or is there something lost in doing that or like what's yeah, the yeah, I think you, you can gain, you can lose, yeah. Mm. And uh, it depends what you're working with, what kind of text. I mean, to put ourselves above Shakespeare and Ibsen to say, I can do better, it's, it's a bit strange, obviously. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but I don't, with Shakespeare, I don't think it's so much changing the, the text. It's not adding so much. I, I'm not sure with Ibsen, but of course, there's been directors taking the liberty, uh, liberty to, you, to, to, to change the words, right? To modernize the words. Mm. Um, so I don't think this is a, this is the challenge, but I mean, there's Romeo and Juliet was written when it was written, uh, for an audience in Elizabethan times, right? There was a different theater, different moral values, different references. So yes, putting it today and put it in a context that more people today can relate to this. One of the most famous, oh, the famous, most famous love story of all times. Is it so that today they can, uh, people can relate to, obviously, that the father doesn't like your boyfriend? Yes, of course, they can relate, uh, relate to that. But it's, it's, you need to see it maybe in a different context, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe. It can well, be something, but also putting on a funny hat and giving all funny costumes or uh, in a different direction takes away something that they originally wrote. I mean, Shakespeare, he was a man of the people. He was the actor on stage. He was writing for the crowd in front of him. So, and he was a great observer of people. Mm. So taking away that, uh, putting on a funny costume or making the scenography something, you know, from the, uh, I don't know, two big uh, towers or something that takes away everything from what he originally wrote is also taking away all the nuances from his character work. And this, I don't think, is a very good idea. Now, because I, I remember um and that's Shakespeare in, in, in uh, uh, based on Shakespeare, uh, talking about the Verdi's opera, mm -hmm. Othello. I, that was, to me, such an uh, interesting example. Because, um, you know, they had so-called modernized it, so the stage was with neon lights and stuff like that. And because they shall not be uh, old-fashioned or sentimental, because, because that's sort of uh, uh, embarrassing somehow. But it was interesting that the actors... The, well, first of all, speaking of script, 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 the script was so good, the actors and uh, actors, singers were so good that I was still standing there and thinking, my God, he's doing it again. I thought this time <laughs> Othello wouldn't be fooled by him, you know, but he still manages to, yeah, to fool him. Yeah, yeah. But so, so all that, um, that uh, idea that they were trying to 
get away from this sentimentality they didn't manage it because the story itself had so, so much potency mm -hmm. but of course you can destroy a story with mm. if because that's my my beef with this is that if you so-called modernize it you you see that uh, director you don't see shakespeare or 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 that story or you see the actor sir lawrence olivier in his hamlet he was a young man who couldn't make up his mind. That was his take on it, mm. Mm, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so, you know, uh, it can be also if the, the actor is uh, not a working actor, but <laughs> a movie star, then he can get to do that. So, no, I agree. It could be the scenographer, it could be the costume designer, and you see more of them. It's like a idea on top of things. But, I mean, come on, there's, uh, we... Things change over the years, and most of all, we, as the audience, change. I mean, how many stories have the people in front of the, of the, uh, the stage in the globe, uh, how many stories have they heard and seen? How many stories have you and I seen today? But, so but it's, it's, it's a different, it's also the audience has changed. But there's, also, there's still that idea, I mean, uh, for example, I'm, I'm extremely concerned with Moby Dick, that, that novel. And I, you know, when my two oldest children were uh, going to kindergarten, and uh, we were playing that the, bo the, the, the car was that ship. And I told them all about Moby Dick and how uh, it, you know, Captain Ahab is killed and how uh, the, uh, Tashtego falls into the head of the whale mm -hmm. and then it, it starts drowning and it, they were just really into it. Mm -hmm. And I think if you, if you go tap into those sort of fundamentals of the story, then you don't need to modernize it. I mean, I always think of, uh, if you look at the portrait by Rembrandt, mm -hmm. I don't need to paint a modern jacket on him to understand the expression of his face. I can still relate to it. Today, Shakespeare, Ibsen, Chekhov, it's played all, the, all over the world mm. and it survives. So, it's in the core, of course. Mm. That's, that's what drives it, yes. Hmm. And it's fascinating. It's... Uh, to be able to work with Shakespeare, to, to, to go into that world, is, a, is a, it's an education in itself. Hmm. It's a theater school. Hmm. Because uh, you, you, talk, <coughs> you talked about that one, uh, when we talked before this. Uh, that what he's working with are those basic human uh, conflicts. Yeah, and as you were mentioning er earlier with uh, Astor Astorteles and you know going back, it, it's about life and death, mm -hmm. war and peace, hate and love, you know, mm -hmm. it, it's there. <laughs> you never get out of that. <laughs> really, <you know? laughs> um, success, mm -hmm. not success, I mean, mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, it's, uh, and uh, and it opens up for so many, I mean, some people want to modernize, they want to do it contemporary because for some different reason, the, there's another ma maniac as, as uh, Hamlet's father now, you know, it's, uh, could be any world leader, it's crazy, and King Lear, we have many King Lears in the world, we have a Mac oh, how many Macbeths do we have? So the question is, do we have to put them uh, in, a, in a big bath of blood to make it more uh, understandable, uh, you know, mm. coming back to the same thing? Mm. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, th that's the thing I, uh, which is my problem with these so-called modern uh, mm. stagings, that the undertext Sort of is in your face. Yeah. Sometimes, in examples like like yeah, what you mentioned there. Som sometimes they, they want to take the undertext up. But I, I also think that, I mean, remembering, not remembering, but just reading about how was it when, when Shakespeare performed it. He was in, in the Globe. <laughs> 
the audience was standing in front. That was, you know, the, the cheapest tickets were there. Maybe they were invited. The most in, 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 expensive t uh, tickets, they were up on stage or up here because they were the rich people. That they, they wanted to be seen mm. with the actors. <laughs> so they were here. So you were acting at, oh, there's the Duke of, uh, uh, you know, York is up there. So they were on stage, you know, and there was no, hardly no scenography. Right. Maybe you had a throne just to indicate that there was a king there, you know, right. where they're doing Julius Caesar. Maybe they just had a throne to say the king is here after the battle. So there was nothing. So I and the stage directions, they spoke of what happened and there was stage directions, obviously. But uh, I'm sure they were doing effects as well, bringing the undertext up. Mm. Uh, I'm sure they did, but um, it was a different different way of presenting the work. Agree or disagree if you want to uh, paint your whole scene with blood in Macbeth. It's been done, of course. And then thinking of blood in those days when Shakespeare wrote it, blood a different meaning. It was more to do with the divine, with the religion. It was more life and death. death. It was folklore. It wasn't now blood in the, the mind of people has a different meaning, I think. It's, it's more... So also this, also the, the, the symbols, also the... the... Um, the uh, imaginary... Um, scenes or the imaginary... Um, words he uses mm. is different. It was different in his time, so mm. this can change, right? It's, um... So to play Shakespeare, I think it's important to, to go back. And as an actor, you always have to know <laughs> what you say, you know, what does it mean, you know? Right. In a way, as in life, but, you know, <laughs> sometimes we just but, talk. But uh, uh, yeah, you know, so they have to know what did this word mean in Elizabethan time? Yeah. And when we know that Shakespeare, he invented 2,500 words himself, right? So it's a whole, there's a whole world of things. So I think you also have to know to understand what you say, if you're going to play Shakespeare, for example, or but if you're going to do, obviously, whatever you're going to do, you have to uh, understand what you, what you say. What, what does Oba say? What is, what does it mean? What does the character do? What, what, how, how is the character? So, you know, the seven questions, you know, the big seven questions that always come back to is, I hope I remember now, but it's, um, <clears throat> who am I? Where am I? What time is it? What do I want? Why do I want it? Um, how am I going to get it? And what prevents me from getting it? <laughs> this is the seven main basic questions that Stanislavski wants you to ask yourself for every character. Everything you do is that. That's the base. And within these seven questions, there are so many other questions, right? So this is a big job. As we were talking earlier, no one knows what happens in private, right? The, the, the groundwork, you have to do the groundwork. But mm -hmm. this is what you have to ask yourself. And it's not so, in a way, it's like, it's life. Mm. It's life, it's philosophy. You have to know, and this is a big question. Why are we here? Rune Tempte? This has been highly educational and really interesting. Thank you for coming to the KO Palace. Thank you very much. Thank you for watching. And I also want to thank our top patrons, uh, Dean Anthony, Fergus Ryan, Anders Parge Christensen, Alistair Blaine, Eric Lasky, Jared Fountain, Michael Irish, Sean Roberts, Stacy Evangelista, Trim Jordal, Peter Assinger, Horik Jordal Andreasen and Hermann Borge, as well as our anonymous donors for making the show possible. And remember to go to kopalace.com slash subscribe 
and become a member and check out the benefits you get from becoming one. I'll see you next month.